Spectrum wants to hear your views. You can SMS at any time during the show. Type Spectrum, leave a space, type in your contribution and name, then send it to 7197. Your views, our interviews on Spectrum, Radio 1, FM 90. Hello, a very warm welcome. This is Spectrum on Radio 1. I'm your host, Edmond Tezito. On Spectrum, tonight we review the week. Some of the issues we'll be looking at tonight. The democratization process in the FDC. Mundu takes over from Dr. Vesja, this, uh, the second uh, FDC president uh, they've had. The DRC conflict rages on as rebels take major town. They took Goma at the start. They took Saki as well. Some people think, well, they say they want to go to Bukavu. Some people are skeptic, uh, skeptical about that possibility. The oil debate in Parliament, the executive is weighing in heavily, trying to get more, min more power to the minister. We'll talk about that. Our guests tonight. Honorable Lydia Wanyoto, two-time Uganda representative of the East African Parliament. You're most welcome, Honorable Wanyoto. Thank you, and good evening, listeners. We are also joined by Dr. Arthur Bainom Jisha, head of the Peace and Security Program at Accord, also a lecturer at Makere University. You're most welcome, Dr. Bainom Jisha. Thank you, and good evening, listeners and viewers. We are also joined by Mr. Nicholas Opio, a legal consultant at Archive, also a commentator on political and social affairs. You're most welcome, Mr. Nicholas Opio. And thank you very much, uh, Edmond. Good evening to my fellow panelists, and uh, good evening to all the Listeners. Mm. Now, Honorable Wanyoto, yesterday Mujisha Muntu beat Nandala Makfari with a, it was a tight race. Some people had thought it would be a landslide in favor of Muntu. Uh, Muntu, uh, you know, he took it in good stride. He said, No time to celebrate. We all moved together. FDC has won. In your view, what were the FDC delegates voting for yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> in your view, as an independent analyst, we know you dress in yellow, both day and night. But what do you think the FDC delegates were voting for, for yesterday? Were they doing what? Voting. Were they voting for? They were voting for a party president um, for the FDC. First of all, I don't want to say that I'm just a. Uh, what did you call me? Yellow by the <laughs> yellow by the night. No, the dictator. What an object. I'm just I am not an objective <laughs> analyst. <laughs> I am not an objective analyst in this because I'm a practicing politician and, and, and I therefore have a deep interest, more even than NRM in what other parties are doing. Um, one as a practicing politician, but also to know what others are doing we can better the leadership in Uganda. So having said that, um, yesterday the FDC voted uh, in the general mission with Gregory Montreal as the party president replacing Dr. Vesige. I congratulate him. One, at a first level because I worked with him for 10 years in this African Assembly. Number two, that he's been trying this, this was the third time to, to look for the leadership of the party. And finally, he, he did the test and uh, his people, the delegates of the FDC, found him, uh, him fit now to lead them. So I congratulate them and I also congratulate him. Um, I also congratulate him on what he saw for his candidature. He kept saying, I think his catch slogan was that you cannot give what you don't have. Mm, and that he had uh, integrity, solid integrity, which I can testify, having worked with him for 10 years, but also maybe for a dance that worked with him in the other, in the, army. In the parliament, in the parliament of Uganda, where he was an MP, but also in the army. So that one he has commitment, he has shown it, because he's been in the party and tried to lead it. This was the third trial. And also resilience, he, he fought in the celebrated Bush War in the branch of Uganda. That is the sacrifice that he made. And therefore, I think he sold what you could do, test him and, and you find him that actually he had. And, and uh, if there's anything that you can take from his campaign, that's what he was able to sell what he had. And, and also I want to congratulate my brother, uh, Neka Nandala Mafabi, and the owner of Mojo Kanya. It was their first time at a shot of the FDC village, but they did a good job. I mean, the race between Nandala and the moon was clearly tight. A difference of hard left for the bots is, uh, is not something to joke around. He, they've done well, and I, 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 I congratulate Nandala and, uh, and uh, Jeffrey Kanya. But people, people who comment about us that stand out to, 
to contest for the parliamentary or leadership politics. They don't know what it takes. It's a lot of courage. It's a lot of courage. It's a lot of sacrifice. It's, it's a lot of what I'm calling it, Swahili the Minzan. You know, you, you stand on a weighing scale and the people will weigh you that, like, for the last three months, they've been on a weighing scale on Minzani to say who takes it. And therefore, I, for, for, for Nandala and, uh, and Ekanya, I take off my heart for them. For Mutu, he's been there, this was his bad time. But for Uganda, this one I must say, and um, because I've been a parliamentarian, maybe I need to call to our leaders in parliament, is they, they must make operation more. The, the article in the constitution that requires uh, the funding of political parties so that we can really resource our political parties. I mean, this is going to be an issue of the rich, and I'm, I'm saying it, Edmond, from the bottom of my heart. Um, these guys, to be able to sell their country, they have to go around the whole country. Where do they get that money? It's very expensive. No wonder there was no woman contestant. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, because I know, I know where I'm coming from. I'm yeah. a woman, yeah. and I have worked so hard for the last 19 years of my public life. But it, think of it, I, I was like, would I have picked nomination funds? I cannot afford to go around. I cannot afford it. Because what we are doing is that for... Internal party primaries, the party does not fund you. You, do, you go it alone with your friends. I don't know how much Arthur would give me or, <laughs> or, 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 or <laughs> But you know, I would love to be a party leader. Mm. But if it is going to take personal resources, then I don't qualify. And I, I have, I'm, I've not talked to many women in FDC because they are still either very tired sleeping, I've not met any one of them, or they are still celebrating, whichever it is. But I know for a, for a, for a fact that there are women in FDC who could have put the nation from where they able, as one of those issues. They were, they, not, they don't have resources. And therefore, let government, it's a serious government, let government fund these political parties that are serious so that we get the issue of uh, res fair resource support to them and to provide them to us, especially women. Me, yes, I congratulate you, Felicity, but I am not happy that no man picks nomination forms. And the reason for me, I think one of them is resources because they are to fund a three month hard campaign. And then you know what happened in the final practice, you know, get people to Nambole and look back at them and with the media strategy and all those things. But, yeah, I, I, I was trying to calculate the most conservative expenditure of any one of them could have taken like 300 million shillings. Uh, where would you get that? Why would me and you, where would I get that? <laughs> and you know that... From your the, bank. Are you that poor? Are you that poor? Are you that poor? Are you that poor? Are that poor? Are you that poor? Are you that It goes out to say that... Uh, these political parties that are beginning to come out and seek the mandate of the people should be funded to the, to the minimum that is possible. All right. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Arthur, what, in your view, were the FDC delegates voting for yesterday? What uh, were the, delegate, the FDC delegates voting for yesterday? I think uh, Lydia has uh, honestly articulated it. Well, I mean, uh, what qualities uh, were they looking for? If I, they looked at it, when they were looking at the tree, an abrasive man, a diploma, what were they looking for yesterday? I, I think uh, Muchamont, who won, uh, consistently sold his clean record. He also sold his patriotism, uh, uh, his background uh, in, as, a command, as an army commander. And of course, you know, Ugandans, most Ugandans want security. So I think he sold that security. You know, most people think it's the military, who can, military people who can manage the, this complicated uh, uh, conflict to read the country. So people, I think, voted for security. They voted for clean uh, leadership and discipline, uh, which actually Muchamunt voted. But I think what uh, uh, the, all the candidates looking at all of them denied Ugandans. And perhaps I thought that here was an opportunity for them actually to lay out the future plan, even if some of them would not make it is they didn't articulate a future strategy uh, uh, on how they are going to address the critical challenges facing this country. Of course, they, uh, when you talk about clean leadership, I think he was trying to, to address the issue of corruption and uh, uh, in that respect, the wastage. Uh, the wastage. But I think uh, they are serious. I, I thought that you would move uh, beyond that. And again, that was not an package. It, it remained clean. I think uh, uh, we needed to see a comprehensive strategy in addressing Uganda's problems. For instance, of course, unemployment. Well, maybe uh, those will come. Later. I come later. Later. I've just been discussing the, uh, this with my colleagues, really. But, uh, I mean, Ugandans, there are issues that, uh, and you know, uh, watching the Obama campaign, there is something that we can borrow. When Obama actually gave that, uh, uh, he gave a keynote as, uh, address at the, uh, the Democratic Party convention, 
uh, actually he outlined, he laid his campaign strategy which actually propelled him to become a candidate, a presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. So I needed, we needed them to articulate a comprehensive uh, uh, strategy to solve Uganda's problems that are pressing, including, of course, corruption. Let's look at these qualities that we've outlined. I've listed just four of them. Clean, a clean record, patriotism, security, and discipline. Yeah. Would the NRM score high on this? Who? Sorry? Would the NRM score high on this? <laughs> now, uh, uh, now, why are you... Uh, your questions are ready. <laughs> Questions are, are, are really leading questions sometimes. <laughs> they don't care. So, but uh, I think now, uh, NRM for the first time, I think they are now going to, you know, for a long time we've been advocating for a strong royal opposition, a strong, credible opposition. And I, and, and I think, yeah, because you see, uh, and my, 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 my sister here is a NRM, and it, it, it is known. For some of us, we never show our colors because we are in civil society, want to continue playing a mediating role. But I think oh, we, without, I without, <laughs> yeah, during day and night, <laughs> without a strong, credible position, we cannot have a strong, effective government. So what we have now yeah. is that actually the, NRM, the, 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 the FDC has set a record, has set a record upon which the future leadership, uh, even the current leadership, has actually to focus on, including, of course, uh, clean leadership and the uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, and the uh, and the discipline. You don't want to weigh the, the, the NRM on this. Yeah. I think for now uh, uh, it is too it, it is too early. But yeah. Nicholas Opio, talk to us about your own view. Of course, it's what sort of as well. Talk to us what you <laughs> think, what, what, what you think we can expect from our moon to presidency at the FDC. Well, first, I think the civil thing to do is just say congratulations to first the FDC for conducting a very relatively peaceful election in a very civil no, election. Uh, you know, it was it was relatively very peaceful, although some hot bubbles were exchanged, but I think that uh, it was a very good election. Uh, but also, secondly, to con I mean, just tell Muntu that you might have won the election, but the bigger task is ahead. The bigger task of, 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 of carrying forward uh, FDC is ahead. So I, th I think I think for the FDC it's a good thing, but also for the country I think it sets a good example to other parties, CP, JEMA, and all the other 43 political parties in this country, that in order for this country to have democracies, all the political parties must become democratic in their own internal structures. Elections must be transparent, uh, all parties must address the question of accountability, <coughs> that, that elections must be reflecting the views of and the people. Benchmarks. So, yeah, it, I mean, exactly, benchmarks. So it's, so it's a good thing for us as a country, but also for FDC as a party. But I think this election was an important election for FDC because FDC had come to a crossroad. The FDC that metamorphed from reform agenda had become a party that was associated with uh, being very hard, civil disobedience, almost bordering militaristic attitude to the approach to the governance of our country. So much so that the FTC became pronounced and known for its popular demonstrations. The president of the party became known for his rather hard stand, uh, stamping uh, um, campaign speeches. So it was a crossword for FDC whether to continue with that sort of party, which in my view was fast losing support because you're having uh, people's lives being disrupted, or having a party that was going to be a different party, more engaging, more civil, but also more about reasoning than just emphasizing civil disobedience and a fight. So I think that was what the FTC had to decide. Luckily enough for FTC, I think they have chosen a candidate who personifies diplomacy, a person who personifies a clean record. The combative nature of Nandala and the rather very drawn back and more reasoning nature of Montu was what the party was choosing and the party has chosen. A military general who is very sober, clean, you know, you can rely on him for reason other than his military record. That was what the FDC was choosing. And I think that the FDC is going to have to have a turnaround to try and rebrand itself from a, a fighting party, a party that was one associated with a rebel group, name it, you know, you know, you know about the PRA and all these I mean, allegations, to a party that will come to the fore to confront the ruling party and try and take over power. But also I think more importantly, 
and the challenge that Monty will have to face is the challenge of the big man syndrome. I was arguing with somebody today, and, and, uh, and I said Uganda's next election will be determined by three things. Corruption, you need the economy, whatever you name it, Museveni, and Besige. Besige was on this radio. He has refused to tell you that he won't contest for election. So he has got to deal with the big man syndrome that the NRM is dealing with in Museveni. The FDC has to deal with it in Besige, who casts a very big shadow on FDC. Will Besige contest against Muntu for a flag bearer of FDC? We we'll wait to see. That is the thing I'm looking up to, and I think that that will determine well, the future of FDC. But Besige decided to set aside long before his term was due to expire. That, that kind of mindset would it still be in the U.S.? What worries me is that there is a possibility of that happening, but and that Besige has been non-committal yeah, twice yeah. over this session. Well, but some people, twice. Have, some people have said that if uh, Mandela had taken it, they think he's a weak candidate. Can't take on the NRM, whoever they choose to give us, whether it's Kenya or. <laughs> so, they say that, so they say it's better yeah. if if Nandela would was going to take it, then Besia would stand, and if I want to take it, he can carry it. Both. I, I think no. it, it is not fair mm. for us to start now discussing, you know. speculate about what people would do. Mm. I think that is personifying people so much. But I think, what do you uh, mean? yeah, you know, it's giving people too much than actually there is to start. I, I was in Tanzania, and people started saying, what would Nyerere say if, on this question if he was here? In my it's just giving Nyerere too much. But the point, I think uh, you, you, are, you, are, you are very right. Uh, I think when, when the FDC, Muchamuntu uh, uh, assumes his power fully, uh, he has to deal with a number of challenges, and, and he has pointed out one of them. But I think there's one of them, I uh, Edmund, is the whole thing of credibility. Yes. I think FDC, uh, it, you know, it became a refugee home for people who were disgruntled, for people who uh, who had uh, 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 who had problem, who also had credibility problems. Mm. So that, you know that Michamunt has come on board actually uh, promising a clean record. I think he has to deal with that. So one would 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 want to see him taking some time trying to sort out the party. And I think I like his, during the, the debate on WBS, uh, he said you cannot give what you do not have. And I think that's what he said. But I think that he now has to deal with the credibility issue well, so that actually people do not jump from like. The NRM and to, to another NRM. Well, I mean, so, I, mean I think it's a good thing. <laughs> people, people cross parties. <laughs> Uh, to, be, to be honest, there are people who perhaps have been punished, yeah. have been punished for various reasons, for poor record performance, because and indiscipline. And out of this disgruntlement, yeah. and, and, and I'm serious on this, because what one would want to see as Ugandans is qualitative politics, that actually we are moving from one level to another, which actually is also going to influence the NRM to also reform and shape up to that standard. I think Muchamut sets that high, high record, and I think he needs to look around and be able to assemble a team of Ugandans that are qualitatively different. I am just, just to be fair to the NRM, to imagine that anybody who leaves the NRM and joins FDC is doing so because of a bad record. I, th I think it is bad. <laughs> no, 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 this in NRM and yeah. in FDC, especially looking, looking at the level of corruption. Looking at the level of corruption, that and actually people... I mean, of course, currently, you know, the, the whole problem of corruption, of which course, in, gov in government which now. Which and you are likely to find people who jump even with bag or bags of money which and go most to a party that is poorly resourced. That's why you go wrong with corruption. It's a party issue. It's a national issue. It's a national issue in Uganda. You have people... He has just told us that he is not is a non-partisan because he must propel his civil society face. Yes. We have taken across in Uganda. By law, they are not party members. Right. But you know that what is an earth thing is these are civil servants that are running with banks of money. Overseen by so, so you, yeah, 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 overseen, but not, not for, the It's not a decision of the party. Honorable, overseen by politicians, both from, uh, by their accountability committees in the parliament, which oversee money. Honorable, uh, from opposition. Honorable, what kind of leader would clean so, up so this, for me, this let, over let this What kind of leader would clean up the rest of right. Ugandans, mm. we, we, if we want to fight corruption, let's not partisan it. We shall we lose the battle.
there's a difference between individuals and institutions. Yes. Who runs the institutions? Well, I've, 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 I should deal with those individuals that run institutions. Nicholas, do you think the NRM is worried by Mujisha Mutu when? Well, I don't know. I'm not in the NRM. Uh, the NRM person is here. I, I, can't, I can't think for them. But I think that Mujisha Mutu presents a very credible candidate. If he's come up against anybody from the NRM, he presents a very good option. He would send many people thinking twice. I've spoken to many people who are more or less withdrawn from FDC who now think that perhaps there's some hope. Perhaps there's a guy we can go to. Perhaps there's a guy who can lead this country. So I think he presents a good candidate for this country. And of course, so are the others. The others would also make their case. But I think that Mundo presents a credible candidate. That does not just resonate with many of, uh, of, 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 of FDC party members, but also in the region. I mean, remember he was at Arusha for a long time. You know, he has cultivated himself an image, not just in Uganda, but also outside Uganda. But also, more importantly, Bessage's claim in the last election, which uh, I'm made to understand annoyed, uh, you know, army generals of the president, that, that he has support of the army, was, in my view, uh, appeared to be rather a hollow claim. If there's anybody who can now claim to have people in the army that he can rely on, Bishop Mundu can't be that person who can cut across the army. You think he can? He hasn't said it, but the, he has had a very clean record in the army. Yes. I think that people in the army still look back to the days when, when there are no ghosts, when there are no ghost soldiers, when salaries were coming, when there were no supplies of small boots or one size boots. That is the leader that people will look up to. That is the legacy left in the army. I think that. Okay, you're <laughs> I'm not campaigning for him. I'm just outlining what I think is a quality. You would be really to warm to him. Because some people have said it's going to be difficult for anyone to salute anybody else other than the seven. Yeah, but do you think they would salute a general Monto? Well, they have done that before in the riots here, walk to work, when <laughs> President Museveni's son was commanding a battalion here in Nakasero. Monto was passing and people were saluting him. So he has been saluting Monto? Yes. Yes. But he's the only general of record. You I mean, you can't deny that, that he's an outstanding army man, but also a very good person. You would be hard pressed to beat this guy. Really, you would be hard pressed to I beat him. <laughs> of the three candidates is the only FDC presidential candidate who appeared on this program and a few days later he went on to win. Well, I listened to your show. It was a pretty much show you have worked for me. It was the campaign. Discover the new invigorating taste of Red Vodka Lemon. Red Vodka Lemon. Reinvent the night. Not for sale to persons under 18. Uh, excuse me, guys. Let me through, please. Yes. Check, check this guy. Goodness, dude, what are you doing? Get real. Just, just move. Just what? A little to beat. Man, wh what are you doing bringing a cow into the sitting room? It's just for when I want milk. Just what? Just please move. Just let it come and sit here. What's wrong with this guy? You cannot keep a cow in your home, but you can get the freshness of its milk straight from the farm into your home. Get fresh diary milk for freshness straight from the farm every day. Fresh diary. So fresh. Eh, uh, Sava, Sava, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Kogole Andemina. Very serious Congolese tailor. People see me when they want to look good. People leave my shop looking like superstars of TV. But however much I make you look beautiful or even sexy like me, <laughs> I cannot change the person inside, the real you. Kind of like you guys. Waraji. It has this beautiful look, uh, but inside they have maintained the same old spirit that we know. The same old spirit we have known for many years in a new suit. Uh, uh, sorry, new look. <laughs> oh, you need to try it. Enjoy the new look Uganda Waraji. The same Ugandan spirit with a new look. Uganda Waraji. Same spirit, new look. Uganda Waraji. Excessive consumption of alcohol is harmful to your health, not for sale to persons under 18 years. Please drink responsibly. Spectrum on Radio 1 FM 90.
welcome back. Welcome back. In fact, Sam, tonight uh, we're looking at the week just yeah, gone by. Give me we're going to be looking at the DR Congo, the oil debate, and yeah, we'll be talking about the FDC campaign. We'll talk about it a little bit more, looking at the future between now and 2016. In our guest tonight, Dr. Arthur Bainum, the head of the Peace and Security Program at Accord, also lecturer at Macquarie University, uh, in the Peace, uh, peace uh, Studies. <laughs> Mr. Nicholas, of your legal consultant at Archie, you'll also commentator on political and social affairs, and Honorable Lydia Onyeto, two time Uganda representative at the East African Assembly. She worked with General Moon to the win of the FDC campaign for 10 years in Arusha. You might not be able to call in tonight, but you can send your text message to 7197. That is, type the word spectrum in your phone browser, send a message to 71. You can see you are beginning to qualify our session. <laughs> But we say we don't like to dress, you dress in yellow balls. There are fellow MPs and they are like... Dr. Bailum, no, <laughs> when, doctor, when Muntu I goes... I was with for 10 years. All right. When Muntu goes to his office in Najan and Kumbi on Monday morning, what's going to be on his notepad that morning, do you think? What kind of changes is he going to route? And what kind of things is he going to be looking at as priority? I think the priority, uh, I think, for uh, General Muntu, uh, uh, Mr. Honare Mucha Muntu, is actually to unite that party. Party. Uh, the unity for the party, as you rightly said, the margin uh, between him and and and, and, and Honor Unanda was very very small, uh, which actually left the party a bit uh, fractured. I think he has to work and unite the party and, and make it cohesive in order to, to 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 move forward. I think the second thing, of course, is going to be uh, building their party structures, building the party structures on the ground. I think there are places that they are they are not yet filled, and they need to build a bottom-up structures and to be able to raise power if they have to, or to, com to compete with the NRM which has a solid that sort of structure. But the second point, uh, the third point we've already talked about is, is, is finances. I think they didn't, they don't have money and, uh, and again of course, uh, let me tell you, even in democracy like the US, this last campaign was, the two, was it 2.8? Almost, expensive, uh, almost expensive. the most expensive and yet in a consolidated democracy. I think the party uh, or any political party in this country to be able to deliver democracy and to compete favorably, they need to, to fundraise. Exactly. And, and just, just emphasize and the that point. That's just the point. That, yeah, yeah. Just mm. Mm. You see, it's also a big stability issue because people be pressed to the wall. Who is funding there? Campaigns. I, I have a passion to leave the country. I don't have money. Somebody comes with the money with the bags of money. So let's not tempt our leaders. Let's fund them and mm. cause them to account well, when they run an election. Just, just to make another point mm. to both of the point that looking at the US election, there is actually a state financing system that delegates run away from, that candidates run away from, and chose to go to the people to vote, because I mean, to pay them. So I think that we've got to also begin to create an atmosphere in which a businessman in Chikubo wouldn't fear funding Besige, wouldn't fear funding Betty Kamiya, wouldn't fear funding whoever it is, because it's an, or, or Honorable Lydia Wanyoto, she look a good president, by the way, I can tell you that. So we have to have that kind of system, that people who want to finance parties do not fear because I think what happens in Uganda here is that people fear giving money to parties because if you're seen to be giving money to some other party you're in problems your business will be attacked will be exactly otherwise. exactly so that kind of atmosphere has to be created so that people actually own parties I think that parties must be owned by the people by its members that's correct and how much money are members giving the FDC how much money are members giving the NRM they had to be forced and their salaries were being cut from parliament to find the NRM yeah. so you've got to have a system of people voluntarily give money to their parties just to, uh, uh, yeah, to, uh, to the exactly uh, and I want to agree with the Lydia and of course my colleague uh, uh, Nicholas here uh, we come to the whole point of political party financing I think this is an urgent matter and you know the, the law was passed but I think uh, 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 we need to go back on the drawing board and 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 systematic and political, political party, party so that actually they don't they are not tempted to get any money because out of this as he says, they may be attracted to that money and that, that, that com could compromise our national security and national interests. Well, let's move forward. Let's go to Congo right now. This week, the are rebels that uh, took Goma, which is a key in economic base. They have uh, taken Sati as well. They claim they will take uh, Bukavu very, very soon. Some people think it's unlikely to happen. We know that one of the leaders, uh, the rebel leaders, uh, Bishop Jean-Marie Runiga, is in the country. He's supposed to meet with President Museveni. Nicholas Opio, what can we expect in the coming weeks and months uh, in the DRC? 
events well you can see he rushes home well he used to he live in Makindia he used to live in Makindia Vuziga area he was living with Astro Rob MC so we know that he's come back home yes. but I think that events are unfolding pretty fast in Congo it, it might be difficult to predict what will happen but I think that uh, the thing that is, 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 is most surprising and that nobody wants to discuss is how the rebels have been able to run over Goma. They all of a sudden, they walked in the all of a sudden, the they have the firepower. For me, it does speak to a rebel group that is far more than just a ragtag group of people. That is the question we haven't been discussing. Instead, what we are doing is trying to bandage you know, bandage this war, you know, try to bandage this wound. I think we've got to go down and begin to discuss the overall question of who is financing these rebels. Because they're the guys who actually have the ability to call the shots. Not some, I mean, I watched the three heads of state give a press conference. The body language at that press conference was telling. You couldn't, you wouldn't. I mean, any, anybody who watched it, you have a president of Rwanda reclining on his chair, looks disinterested, spoke with no conviction. You have the president of Uganda who seemed to be looking over his shoulders left and right all the time you know you have president of Uganda yes look over his shoulders yes he was looking left to Kagame looking left to Kabila right to Kabila so, so the body language for me spoke volumes it speaks to me that there is a bit of difficulty in arriving at an, an, as an, at an agreement between these three leaders who had for very known reasons been in conflict with each other, I mean, with, with each other for a long time we know for a fact that K Kabila called Rwanda the bad boy of the region two weeks ago. Yes. You have President Museveni and That's Kagame true. who have had very you know, controversial roles in the DRC. So I think that what is happening in, in the DRC is that there's a lack of credibility in this whole process. I think that President Museveni and Kagame, however well intentioned they are, cannot in my view deliver a credible and acceptable solution to the problem of the DRC. And I think that it is time we have got to involve in my view what I think are neutral parties because if you have a Rwanda and a Uganda that is being accused of funding the rebels you cannot have the same folks leading the process to negotiate I think we've got to begin to see a more pronounced role for the African Union but also Comesa and the East African you know region you know Yala is, is, is a bit quiet you have you have you have you have Comesa we have to have something more credible. What we, have, what we have is not credible. Because the ICGLR is being led by President Museveni. The very same. The he's the chairman of, the, of, 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 of that group. We, we have had a pact for how many years? That pact hasn't delivered peace in Eastern DRC. So I think that we've remember, got to have... Remember um, a President Museveni led a group that uh, 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 a, a, a regional body that uh, delivered peace in Burundi. So it's on record. Well, I, think, I think Burundi, my, my view is different about Burundi. You've got to look at the role of Zuma and the government of South Africa, which was more pronounced and more powerful than the role President Seven played. You know, of course he played some role, but I think that the biggest problem is the lack of credibility. Because we just cannot have folks who are being accused of being involved in the war, the same one looking for solutions. But there's a cloud you need to play up for us, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. You said President Museveni was looking over his shoulder. Who was he looking for? Where does his authority come There were three heads of state at that press conference. Who had the power? Then? There was Paul Kagame, yes. there was Kabila, and President Museveni. President Museveni sat in the middle. I watched that clip over and over again. And the the body language was just telling. He kept looking to the left, looking to the right. He just appeared uncomfortable. The commanding articulate president didn't show up on that day. Who was that? President Museveni. Yeah, but that's what mediation is all about. Uh, if you allow me to come in. <laughs> okay. The body language yeah, yeah, is telling. I, uh, uh, of course, uh, one of the mistakes I think that were made uh, in the case of Congo was uh, a country that has had emerged out of that uh, severe uh, uh, violent conflict for it to have immediately embraced the, uh, the uh, electoral politics, uh, which produced the winner takes it all. I think, I think we got it wrong at that point, because when a country emerges, transits from war to peace, 
it is very fractured uh, it is very uh, 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 disunited and a lot of violence and, uh, and killings have taken place so the immediate uh, phase should have been actually coalition government I think a coalition government should have coalition government so they have different they government. are different political parties so you, an inclusive kind of arrangement should have been put in place and you see this is what is happening in Syria all these uh, rebels so have, have, have been put together so that they can form a united front so what happened is that actually it was winners it was victors just uh, Kabira took over and alienated others. So what you see are people fighting for political inclusion. But they pursued the political exclusion uh, agenda and I think that did not help to consolidate peace but in the country. So so the the government, they wanted to the government and they mutinied because they were not... No, the, the country, the, you see, they, 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 they became part of the government in 2009. That's why in March, that's why they are called March 23. And actually the, the, the complaint is that once they were integrated, they were not integrated in good faith. Uh, they had agreed actually to remain, to occupy. Uh, they were supposed to remain in, the play, uh, in, in, in Goma, the eastern Congo. Yeah, and and eventually uh, uh, the government started dispersing them. They also claimed that some of the commanders started being killed. And all that you see here is an attempt to, 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 to survive because they were being killed. So I, I, I think again, the peace agreement also did not have the guarantors. The UN that has been there, the hugest uh, UN and the longest uh, UN actually seem to have looked to the other side. So what I see here is still is the whole problem of Congo. Congo still remains what actually uh, Walter described it. The, the map of Africa uh, uh, is that of a revolver and Congo is the trigger. And so uh, the, 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 the So the people the UN itself seems to be interested in the war economies. Uh, the other people are interested in war economies. I think the Congolese are the victims. So what needs to happen now? In fact I sympathize with President Museven when you say <laughs> you know, these people have just marched and taken over Goma and the man runs here and uh, and he uh, chooses Rwanda and he's just seated between them. They can easily box each other. I have participated in mediation. You are carrying actually if you are in a group and actually you risk his own as a mediator you are carrying that problem on your head. So I think he played a very big role if you, you can understand the process. So the, I think the way forward as a, as Nicholas articulates it, first of all is pursue that inclusiveness, inclusive uh, coalition government, but like a broad-based government based on good faith. An agreement must be signed. But two, a, a committed involvement of regional uh, organizations. And you see what also happened. The UN report that came out thwarted the, the regional, uh, the regional uh, 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 process or track, which is the, the regional track under the International Conference of the Great Refugees. In fact, actually, the timing of that report was supposed to stop the, the process, which could have delivered a peacekeeping force, uh, an agreement of all the political parties, uh, a solution coming from the people themselves. So I think uh, that process needs to be given a chance since it is delivered in Burundi. But of course, as you said, if Rwanda and Uganda are blamed, we need a strong guarantor now. I think SADC needs to come in, the AU has to come in, and the, and the East African community to, to guarantee the peace agreement that may come out of this. Honorable Lydia, don't pour water on our people. I was listening to Arthur and uh, Nicholas. You know, uh, Edmund, by omission or commission or direct or inadvertent, to get peace in DRC, you cannot wish away Rwanda, Uganda, and the other neighbors of DRC. True. Even if they don't want, they, they, are real, they, they, are, they must be part of the peace and stability of the DRC. So whatever efforts that are, are going to come on board, they, they cannot ignore Uganda, they cannot ignore Rwanda, Rwanda, and the other neighbors. So are they, how are they the going DRC. to I'm, I'm just, I, I want to make that as a, as a, a mm, fact that you have to live with. Because you can say the President Seven is looking shoulder on his other shoulder and uh, the, the demeanor, you know, does not show trust. Does not, but, but you cannot wish away Uganda. You cannot wish away Uganda. Uh, and therefore, for me, like uh, Arthur has said, we just need to, to get back to the drawing board, both as neighbors, with the other stakeholders, call it South African community, call it the uh, DRC, and get to the bottom of how DRC can be helped on issues of stability and their 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 own governance agenda. They have to they have to agree. How do you do it? And yeah, like, the, the issue of it's not a business as usual to go to a, finish an a, before even the barrel of the bullets becomes cool. You are running an election and that you have won. It doesn't work like that. That's why you find there are as many political camps and fights in the DRC. And as they are in Kishasha. So really, they, they have to, that's the reality, that they have to share power. Mm. 
Uh, they have to share resources and they will not wish away their neighbors. And that their neighbors cannot also sit back and say, well, because they have said I am not clean, let me not be, <laughs> they have to be there. Because they cannot yeah. take yeah. yeah. their, their interest and it's a reality, you know. As so, so either as reason. the government, but also either as individual neighbors. So for me, I think that uh, we, we have to lift the veil and uh, list the, the issues that right. that they are there to sort out as a country themselves, yep. but also the, the neighbors. We must cut out the action points for the neighbors, for the regional book, but also for the country itself. Right. The, the warlords themselves. They, work they have a stake. They, they, have, they, have, uh, they, have, uh, they have a job to do for them. Uh, so moving forward, but Edema. staying with you, Honorable Wanyoto, because of the time. Hmm. The oil debate in Parliament on Tuesday, they will take a final decision on the contentious clause 9. Are you guarantees getting what they deserve in this oil debate? Yeah, the, the, the oil debate in, in Parliament of Uganda, I have followed it partially, but I think it is good for Uganda um, because I have seen a lot of commitment and interest, which is sometimes it hurts when you see a very serious business and you don't see people paying a lot of money. This particular bill. Even if you say that laws are not written in stone, they can be adjusted. The, you, you don't, uh, no clause Even if you say that laws are not long term, what? Laws are not written in stone, so they can be amended. There's always a clause for future amendments. But this time, this particular bill, no clause has gone and scrutinized, which is good. And I, I think um, I want to say that uh, members of parliament who, are, who have taken key interest in this have actually earned their pay. Because they are second two weeks, and I think for me, uh, it's worth the time. Because this is the only resource that uh, has come when many of us uh, are awake <laughs> and a lot of people use the laws to, to clean, to, to, to shortchange Ugandans. The biggest contentious issues that I have seen in that bill are issues of mandates. Yes, uh, should the minister uh, sign the contract? Yes, for personal, I'm still studying the merits and the demerits of that. But I think the, the mood in Parliament is that the haggling of mandate on who, take, who, who, who takes which decision. But uh, bottom line, for me, I think the principle should be that there should be shared responsibility. Give us some meat on that, because you can't have an authority yes, I, giving I, license. Coming, no, that I'm for you are jumping. <laughs> there have been so many clauses. Let's look and, at and the clauses. And I've said there is the role, the, 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 the role of the ministers, the, the role of the, the, the institutions. Because even as soon they are creating, whether you want the EBA, there was even a debate whether it should be a commission or not. Authority. Just listen. Go there, there's also the role of parliament. And there's also the role of uh, the Wanaishi, the, the role of the ministry, PS and technocrats. So, the, for me, I think that um, the mood, the environment in the parliament is w one of suspicion. And maybe it's going to help. It has opened people's antennas to say, let's look at it closer to a not short change, which is also good for Uganda. Because sometimes you find that you have already, it is post mortem, which is very hearty, and somebody maybe was covered in the law. So this debate is healthy. And uh, maybe on Tuesday, we will see how it goes. But for me, if you ask me, I think it is healthy. I mean, whoever is taking us in the bill, know that it's not a business as usual. That's what I can say. Nicholas, what's your own view? Uh, well, I've followed very closely the debate in Parliament and first uh, for the first time on a serious matter on many of the clauses I've seen a bipartisan discussion uh, people from the NRM people from the opposition parties agreeing for what is best for this country and I think that's, that's a good sign how I wish this was the general mood in that house in discussing serious issues uh, but I also do have a bit of concerns uh, about some of the things being discussed it does appear to me that the focus is on the ruler not the rule okay who is going to head what who is going to make which decision but little focus has been on the rule itself because I think that the rule is more important than the ruler because if you begin to discuss what are the ministers powers you know who should be appointed where what should be the process of appointment who should they report to Important as it is, I think misses the point that we have to first and foremost get it right on the basics. The discussion, in my view, has been largely about the rulers as opposed to the rule. We haven't had enough discussion about, for example, rules on wastage, women waste management, environmental issues. That discussion hasn't been had. And I, how I wish that by Tuesday we can get back to that kind of discussion. But I also think that midway through that discussion, we've had a bit of mistrust. There is a policy on waste management. Well, but is the, policy, uh, the, the waste management policy of NEMA 
it doesn't address adequately the oil industry. I think that what is being proposed, in fact, there's actually a new proposal from NEMA about waste management arising out of the oil industry. The second point that I think that got my concern. By way of information, mm -hmm. there are two bills that should be coming uh, around the sector. The first one is this one that is, is uh, on the floor of the house now, but there's another one that will be talking about the actual production mm -hmm. and marketing. Now, when you are producing, that's when the issues of waste will really be at play. And mm -hmm. So they, they, either you won't have an omnibus bill that talks it about it or, or standalone, but that, that's mm -hmm. the, it's a very big issue. Mm -hmm. Issues of uh, environmental management. Yeah. You cannot run away from it. Yeah. But, but even then, uh, that being the case, and I, I mean, I thank you, I thank you for the information. The overall question of the function of the authority, for example, should this authority be a, an authority under the Companies Act, or would it be, a, you know, a commission? That discussion was had, but. Even besides that, you haven't had enough discussions about how that authority will work, okay? What are the rules? What are the procedures? That discussion, in my view, hasn't been well, exhaustive. But national oil policy, 2008, national oil and gas policy, that, which spells out all these things. That hasn't been exhaustive, because I think that that has to be in the law, not in the yeah, policy. Yeah, that has to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a basis, to a basis. But the second most concerning thing for me was the spirit in which the, the energy minister went back on a word uh, in reference to uh, the authority's power. I think they had adjourned three times, had three meetings. Why do you think she went back? What they had agreed. Her explanation is clear that if you allow it to pass the way the MPs want it to pass, we shall be pushing the president away from the decision making in the oil industry. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? In my view, it's a bad thing. I think that what should be done is that this authority must report to parliament, this authority must be independent, and must be able to oversee the technical bits in the oil, in the oil kind industry of a, as no opposed to the minister. Offering licenses and then policing the industry it doesn't work anyway. Well, but you see, these are technical issues. If, if, if you think that it cannot reside in the authority, then it must reside somewhere, somewhere. but minister. not the minister. Well, because I think the minister... Why would you take it? My, well, my view is, 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 is completely different, and, and we can have a whole debate about it. I think that the minister cannot have, she should not have the powers to issue licenses. Because Which one, she, she isn't technical enough. What you can do is, 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 is have, have, have perhaps a separate agency that reports to parliament that is comprised of technical people as opposed to just a minister who comes and goes. Doctor, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, my colleagues have really uh, uh, argued uh, a good case, but I think what I need to note is the, the bipartisan nature in which uh, uh, this view has been this, uh, debated is very good uh, for this country, that at least we see members of parliament across the political party divide coming together uh, to, 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 to legislate a good uh, 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 a good law for this country. I think that is very, uh, that's useful. But the other thing, of course, has to do with the with, with the, uh, the, 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 the the authority, the the petroleum authority. The petroleum authority. I think uh, uh, my view is that uh, actually uh, this petroleum authority uh, uh, should be empowered. Uh, yes more than the minister uh, so that do you want the authority to actually license players my, my view that is that because looking at the, oil, the, the, the the whole experience of oil producing countries in africa uh, i think that the the powers of the minister need to be curbed substantially because of course you know we, we've had cases where uh, uh, some of our ministers they don't need to be not taken good yet. yeah so i think on that note and of course based on what, what is obtaining uh, vesting that uh, uh, vesting that what power. To Explain to us, Doctor, by nomination. No, I'm, I'm not speak like that. No, the whole, the, <laughs> sorry. no of course, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole uh, politics around the oil, the whole uh, uh, bribery uh, allegations and what have you. I think in the short run, we need to vest that authority uh, uh, into the authority. But also, I, I, I also want to add that we, the parliament, also shouldn't be too vigilant to make the city.
sitting president. And I think the parliament, perhaps they always legislate looking at the current president. I think they need to legislate for the present and the future so that you don't also make the president a sitting duck. Uh, because you see, at the end of the day, the president is the chief executive. He must run an efficient government. So if he cannot make decisions, especially with oil, oil, which is going to be an important thing, then it may lead to what, you know, Obama faced with a very hostile uh, uh, Congress and Senate decided actually to, to, to use the presidential orders. Sometimes that also undermines democracy in the long run. So I think the need for balancing here of authority, uh, either vesting it in the minister and in the, in the, and also some level of trust here also needs. I think we see a lot of mistrust, especially by parliament towards the executive. What I think, feels it? Is it misplaced? Uh, uh -huh, that's why the two institutions need to, need actually to, to interrogate their issues, stick to their mandates, but also cut, try to cultivate a middle position and also some trust. Because without that, then we are going to see, it may even delay the whole process of our oil exploration industry. Okay, maybe just before we go, the homosexuality bill, the death penalty has been removed from that. What kind of bill can we, what kind of bill do you think we can expect, we expect from that? Uh, I haven't uh, really studied the, the homosexuality bill. Maybe you could pass <laughs> the video on it. I, I think the, the, the Committee of uh, Legal Rules and Privileges finished their scrutiny of the bill and they are submitting to the Parliament for, for debate. Um, the amendments that we are in, I think, uh, are a result of the public hearings and, out and outcomes of what they were doing when they went to the bill. I think what is pertaining now is acceptable to the interests of Uganda, okay. also as a sovereign state, I want to add that, and also to the wider community. You have to go. Thank you very Why don't you want to ask me about this bill? Uh, you don't want to hear my views about it. You don't want to ask me about it. You don't want to ask me about it. You don't want to ask me about it. Thank you for tuning in. That bill is bad for Uganda for the record. Wow, this is a really nice place. So is there something you wanted to tell me, honey? <laughs> Sweetie? Uh-huh.